turn with me to the book of Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. I realize I haven't preached in seven weeks, and so if I go for two hours, are you guys okay with that? No, 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 no. Probably not. Whoever clapped, you can stay. The rest of you, you can leave, you know. Um, before I get into our, my message here, if we could um, put, the, uh, or put that slide up there with the leadership residency. In the fall, I am going, we're going to be uh, launching a leadership residency at New Life. And really the focus of it is to equip leaders at New Life uh, to be better leaders, whether it, within the church, outside the church. And so it's uh, typically a nine-month, uh, we're calling a residency program. And so if you'd like more information for that, you can uh, go downstairs. You can see me talk to Phil. But we're starting one in September as well, in, as in January. And so... Uh, one of our focus areas has been greater leadership development and cultivating that. And so for more information, you can go downstairs. Now, what I want to do today is I want to teach on a passage, but also share some experiences I've had over the past few months uh, in an effort to really invite you to a new way of being in the world. And I want to say ahead of time that what I'm inviting you to do is, is challenging, is countercultural. It's amazingly simple. And if you're faithful to it, uh, I believe uh, you can have the most spiritually fruitful year of your life. Over the past two months, I've experienced uh, probably the most spiritually fruitful time. And uh, it was so good. I said, I got to share this. I can't just keep it to myself. And so I want to invite you into a new way of being. And, and really, as I've been going through this passage, my heart has been aching for you as a church and for us as a church because I, I think I've tasted something and I, and I want you to experience it as well. And it's like going to a restaurant, you, you, you taste at a good restaurant, it's just like, yeah, I, I want to tell everyone about it because you need to eat there too. And so there's a feast that's before us, and I want you to participate in it as well. And so uh, let, with that, let's go to God in prayer. Let's invite him to speak to us as we look at this passage and really offer ourselves to him. And so let's pray together. Father, thank you for gathering us in this place. I pray, Lord, that you would fill us with the knowledge of your will. Uh, that, the, that, the, that the Spirit gives. And so, uh, Lord, give us ears to hear you today. Give us eyes to see you. Give us a heart to receive every good gift you have for us today. We offer our time to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. Now, today I want to talk to you about the word devotion, the word devotion. Uh, it's actually one of the most important words when it comes to the spiritual life. And because what you devote yourself to directly impacts and affects your relationship with God and impacts and affects your relationship with other people. And so to devote yourself means that everything else doesn't matter as much or other things don't matter at all sometimes. And depending on what you devote yourself to, this could be a delightful thing or it can be a, a, a dangerous thing. And so from time to time, what we need to do is take an inventory of our hearts. We need to check our heart to see where we have been devoting ourselves to. And so the question is, where have you been devoting yourself to? What have you been devoting yourself to? And if you're having a hard time coming up with an answer as to what that might be, I know of a foolproof way of discovering what you are devoting yourself to. And really, it's very simple. It's this, wherever you are spending your money and your minutes are the things to which you are devoting your life to. Wherever you're spending your money and wherever you're spending your minutes, your time, that's the thing that you're typically devoting yourself to. And so today I want to focus on how we spend our minutes. And for many of us, we spend our minutes devoting our, our, our lives to how people think about us or accumulating some possessions or getting a, a particular title, a particular job, a particular lifestyle. But Paul, we're going to see today, wants us to devote ourselves to something very specific. And this is what the book of Colossians is all about. The book of Colossians is Paul giving a, a grand vision of who Jesus is. And as a result, he wants us to devote our lives to him. And so in Colossians 4, Paul begins to spell it out very practically. He wants our lives to be about Jesus. And as a result, he wants us to devote our lives to something very specific and in Colossians chapter 4, beginning of verse 2, we see four words that changed my life over the last two months. Four simple words. Four ordinary words. Four words that have no pizzazz to it. 
but I believe can change your life as well. So Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, beginning at verse 2, he, he says these words, devote yourselves to prayer. That's it. I know you were expecting for something more, something deeper, something more theologically sophisticated. No, no, no. Devote yourselves to prayer. And these four words have deeply challenged and impacted my life over the last few months. Now, up until this point, Paul is giving the Colossians a 10,000-foot perspective of who Jesus is. It's like Paul has taken an airplane, and he's giving us a a large perspective, a a high perspective. And so up to this point, Paul has given us a perspective of who Jesus is uh, cosmologically, who Jesus is metaphysically, who Jesus is in his identity. He wants us to know this is who Jesus is. But now that he's getting to chapter 4, he's landing the plane. He was all up in the clouds. Now he's approaching LaGuardia Airport, and he wants us to know what theology is up here. It can't just stay up here. It has to be lived on the ground. And so Paul is landing the plane, and he gets to chapter 4, which is a chapter about what are the implications about everything that I have set up to this point. Now, up until this point, Paul has given us amazing theology. He has given us amazing truth. He begins with a prelude, letting us know everything that's ours. He says, we know what's yours. Grace and peace is yours. He begins the letter like that. And if you're beginning with grace and peace, you know the rest of the letter is going to be awesome. He begins, grace and peace to you from Jesus Christ. Whatever you need in your life, grace, it's there. And God has peace for you. And after he gives us the prelude, he goes into a prayer. And the prayer that Paul has for us is he wants us to be filled with the knowledge of God's will according to the understanding that the Spirit gives. And so Paul prays for us, everybody, and I've been praying for you, that you would know what God's will is for your life. And after he talks about the prayer, then he goes into a poem. Paul is so excited. He goes into music. He wants to sing a song about it. And he starts writing a song about who Jesus is. And he is the firstborn over all creation. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. Paul is so excited. He's writing music about it. You know you're in love when you're writing music about it. And Paul is writing music about who Jesus is. And after he talks about the poem, then he goes into the power. He says, you have been reconciled reconciled to God. You were once an enemy, and God has brought you to himself with his love, and he gives us a pathway. Walk in him. Live your life in him. Now Paul is landing the plane, and he wants to speak very practically to the church, and I want to speak very practically to us as well, because Paul wants us to live in a particular way. He says, you have been raised with Christ. And to be raised with Christ means that your fundamental identity is not in where you work. Your fundamental identity is not in your possessions. Your fundamental identity is not in where you live. Your fundamental identity is in Christ and Christ alone. And we need to be reminded of that every single day. This is where your identity is from. You've been raised with him. And Paul says, I just don't want you to get it as a theological concept. I want you to experience this. What does it mean to live out the reality that you have been raised with Christ? And so Paul gets to this word, four words he gives us. How to live into the reality that you've been raised with Christ. And he says very simply, very plainly, in an ordinary way, devote yourselves to prayer. Now notice what he doesn't say. Paul says, doesn't say... If you get around to it, pray. He doesn't say, if you can fit it into your schedule, see if you can pray a little bit. He doesn't say, if you get goosebumps or God bumps or you feel the Spirit leading you, then you can pray. No, he says, devote yourselves to prayer. That word devote means to continue perseveringly. That you would continue and persevere in devotion to God. And this brings me to a really important point about Christianity. That Christianity really is is about devotion, which is hard work. And, And I love what Dallas Willard said. Dallas Willard says that the gospel is not opposed to effort. The gospel is opposed to earning. There's a big difference. The gospel is against any kind of, if you think that you have earned the love of God by what you've done, the gospel is radically against that. But what the gospel is not radically against is effort. The gospel is about you have received incredible grace. Now it's time to live out that reality by devotion, to continue 
perseveringly. And so Paul says to be raised with Christ means that a profound dedication to prayer needs to be expressed in our lives. Now, some of you are probably saying at this point, duh, Rich, you're being Captain Obvious this morning. You know, of course we know prayer is important. Of course we know you need to devote yourselves to prayer. But the truth of our lives is this. Most of us in this room are not happy with our prayer lives. Most of us is not all of us in this room. We're not happy with our prayer lives. We all think we can pray more. We all think we can pray better. And so this message is for all of us. And I want you to stick with me. And so Paul gives us an idea. What does it mean to uh, devote yourself to prayer? He gives us two words. He says, I want you to watch and I want you to give thanks. I want you to give thanks and I want you to watch. Give, watch what, Paul? I think this is what Paul would say. Watch yourself. Because we have an ability to drift if we're not watching. And, and, and miss out the devotion that should characterize our lives. Now, last week, I went to the beach with our family and, and in Long Island, and, and at some point, I got into the water. I'm not a big beach person, but I went to the beach anyway, and, and you know, I made sandwiches on the beach, got sand in the sandwiches, you know, yeah, crunching, and it's terrible. That's where, that's where the word sandwich comes from, you know, somebody <laughs> made it on the beach, you know, let's call it a sandwich, you know, and, oh, and, and so, uh, you know, but, but we wanted to get in the water. I said, Karen, you want to come with me? I don't want to come with you, no, I want to stay with Grandpa. So she stayed with Grandpa on the, on, by the shore there, and and I start going into the water, and I said, you want to come in? No, no, I don't want to come in. And so I, I go up a couple of, the waves are coming. I look back, she's lying of sight right there. The waves are coming some more. I look back, she's still right there. And so I say, you know, I may, I may do my Michael Phelps impersonation. And so I start, I start swimming out, you know, and maybe after about 10, 15 seconds, I'm exhausted. You know, I'm just like breathing. And then I, I look back for a second. I've been swimming for 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and I look back just 15 seconds ago, she was right here, but what happened is the, the, the current of the waves just took me. And after about 10, 15 seconds, she wasn't there anymore. She was like in the back of the room over there, and I realized something about the spiritual life. And I realized that if you don't watch, you can easily drift. If you're not watching, you can, you can easily just, you were once devoting yourself to Christ, and all of a sudden, you're over here. And so Paul knows this about us, that in a New York second, we drift. And so Paul says, devote yourself to prayer, watch, and give thanks. And so I want to talk to you about my story a little bit over the last couple of months. But before I go into why we should devote ourselves to prayer and what God is calling us to do, really the question that we need to be wrestling with is why don't we devote ourselves to prayer? What is it about our lives that we don't devote ourselves to prayer? And as I've been thinking about my own life and thinking about the masters of prayer in the church throughout these years, I really landed on three reasons why we don't devote ourselves to prayer. As much as we want to, as much as we like the idea, as, as, as Eugene said last week, we love the idea of prayer more than we actually do praying itself. You know, we love that thinking about prayer. It's fantastic. Do we pray? Not really. You know? and, and so why don't we devote ourselves to prayer? I landed on three reasons in my own life. One is I don't pray. We don't devote, uh, devote ourselves to prayer because we don't see immediate results. And the reason we don't pray is the same reason I don't work out. As you probably can see, you know, it's just like, it's because I want immediate results. There have been times where I work out and 30 minutes go by and 40 minutes go by and I feel bigger. I feel swollen. I feel like, like I'm, I'm looking. And then I go to Rosie. I, I, Girl, what do you think? And, I, and, I, and I, I flex a little. Do I look a little different? She goes, no, no, no. You look the same. And, I, and, and, and it's not working. It's not working. <laughs> and, and so why don't we pray? We want immediate results. And when we don't see results fast enough, we say, this thing is not working. Another reason we don't pray is because we don't feel anything when we pray. And this might be the biggest obstacle to the spiritual life as a whole. Our culture is driven by feelings. And if you don't feel it, it must not be good. If you come to church and you don't feel the song that they sang, you probably say, that wasn't a good worship set. I didn't even play my song. If, if, if you read the Bible, you don't 
feel anything. You're probably, it's, it's, it's worthless. If you pray, you don't feel anything. Feeling is probably the greatest enemy to any kind of deep, mature spirituality. And we don't feel anything. But I, I love what Henry Nouwen says. Henry Nouwen, this is a quote that I come back to over and over. This is what brings me back to prayer. It's these words. He says, one of the experiences of prayer is that it seems that nothing happens. But when you stick with it, you realize something has happened. When you pray, you ever notice when you're praying and you have a season of prayer, you ever notice that something is happening? That when you're sticking with it, you realize, I'm not as irritable as I used to be. You realize, I'm not as angry as I used to be. You realize, I'm not as resentful as I used to be. Something imperceptibly has happened in my life. And that's the nature of prayer. That if you stick with it, even though you don't feel anything, God is still doing something inside of us. And all he's asking is, stick with it. Stay with me. Work with me. Be with me. Because even though you can't see it, I'm still doing something in your life. Don't allow feelings to dominate your prayer life. Prayer is not about feelings. Prayer is about faithfulness. Prayer is about showing up and allowing God to do something inside of you you can't do on your own. And so we don't pray because we don't feel it. And we also don't pray because we're so distracted. We are distracted about anything and everything, and that keeps us from prayer. And I love what one person said. He said it this way. He said, if the devil can't get you to sin, he will make you busy instead. Isn't that true? You'll be distracted to the point, uh, you're busy to the point of distraction. All of a sudden, why aren't we commit devoting ourselves to prayer, as Paul tells us? Because we're so distracted. But Paul wants us, and Jesus wants us to devote ourselves to prayer. And when we think about our church as individuals and our church as a whole, these four words are to carry us. When we think about being the church here in Queens, New York City, and and trying to be a church that, that bridges racial, cultural, economic, and gender barriers, it will not happen without these four words. Devote yourself to prayer. You think about having a a thriving marriage, it's not gonna happen unless we devote ourselves to four words, devote ourselves to prayer. We want to see God work in our workplace, it's not gonna help devote yourselves to prayer. Now, when Paul says that, let's look at where Paul is writing from. He's writing from a particular context, and this is coming out of a particular ordering of life. And so Paul is writing from a particular culture that had what's called fixed hours of prayer, fixed hours of prayer. There were times throughout the course of the day, every single day that were fixed concretely that these are the times that we seek God. We call it at New Life Daily Offices. And this is, I had a kind of a, a, a revitalized, you know, reinvigorated experience with what it is to have fixed hours of prayer. And so G, this is the way that Jesus would pray. Jesus just didn't pray whenever, let me pray, pray to the Father. Jesus had a rhythm of prayer that three, four, seven times a day he would pray. And this is what they understood. This is what Jesus understood. This is what Paul understood. He understood that if we're going to have any kind of spiritual vitality, we need a daily rhythm of prayer, where we pause three to four times a day to be with Jesus, to pray. Now, this practice is not new. Actually, the church hasn't been practicing this for centuries, but I want to give a different perspective or a fresh perspective to get an idea of why we should be entertaining this and and why we should be following through on this kind of seeking God on a regular basis daily. I want you to imagine it this way. Imagine a person who for years has grabbed a coffee and a bagel each morning and then fasted the rest of the day, only taking some sips of water, maybe some juice, maybe grabbing a cracker or a pretzel, and then, that's, and, and then the next day, fat, and then eight in the morning again. Imagine one day that he or she hears that there's a new approach to nourishment. And the new approach to nourishment is something called meals. <laughs> You've heard of it, meals. That instead of just eating in the morning and then having to fast the rest of the day, that in the morning for breakfast, he or she could have eggs and toast and orange juice and home fries and bacon and sausage and, you know, and then that's just the morning. Then lunchtime comes in and you can have a sandwich or a full sandwich and enjoy that and then Dinner time comes and you can have 
pasta and meat and vegetables and salad. And then before you go to bed, you can have an apple pie with a little bit of juice as well. You know, some of you are literally hungry right now. I'm sorry about that, you know. Too late. It's too late. There we go. You know, that's, that's kind of the scenario of what it means to pray regularly. Because the reality is most of us live malnourished lives. We, we, we might pray in the morning and have our little meal with Jesus, as it were. And then throughout the course of the day, we totally forget about our nourishment, our spiritual nourishment. No wonder, you know, when you're hungry, you're irritable, you're angry. No wonder we're so angry throughout the course of the day. No wonder we're so irritable. We haven't, been with, we haven't received our spiritual nourishment from God. And this is what Paul is inviting us to, to pause three and four times a day. Now, I I know what you're saying already. You're probably saying, Rich, do you know my schedule? Do you know what my day looks like? Some of you going into college, maybe you have all these exams, these studies, you probably go, do you you know what my schedule's like? Some of you have demanding jobs and you're you're trying to figure out how can I find this time to do this? Some of you have the most difficult job. You're maybe a stay-at-home mom, stay-at-home dad, and you're you're trying to say, for me, you want me to stop and pray three and four times a day? I want to let you know it is possible. It is possible. There's a story about Susanna Wesley, the mother of John and Charles Wesley, and the the Wesley brothers were the founders of the Methodist tradition. And Susanna had 19 children, and um, and 19 children, and she prayed two hours a day. 19 children and prayed. I was the conviction of the Spirit of God came upon me very much so this past week reading that story, and and they wrote about. Whenever she couldn't find time of solitude, what she would do is she would find a corner in a room and she would take her apron and just place her apron over her head. And whenever the kids saw the apron on top of the head, they knew, do not mess with mom. (laughs) Mom is in the holies of holies right now. She is with talking in communion with God. And I thought, that's the kind of devotion I want. We're 19 crazy kids running around the house, and I still can find time to be with God. And so I want you to experiment this week. I want you to begin to uh, pause. And I'm going to give you some direction here, three to four times a day. If some of you are overwhelmed right now by that, and if you're not stopping one time a day, I want you to stop one time a day to pause, whether it's for 10 minutes. But I want to stretch us, okay? I want us to be stretched to pause three and four times a day because we need to stretch and, and this part of our lives because what we're accustomed to just is not getting the job done. What we're accustomed to is the evangelical way of prayer, which is morning devotions, where you start off your morning with some quiet time. And, 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 and you, you get, try to get filled by God, but by the end of the day, you have run out of gas, it reminds me of a conversation I had with my, my cousin or an experience I had with my cousin in 2003, my cousin Athena. And I was in Florida, and uh, I jumped in the car with her. We were going to go some grocery shopping 15 minutes away from where we were. And as I went into the car, I looked over to see how much gas was left just to see where we were at. And she had three quarters of a tank full. And she said, you know, uh, I, I need to go to the gas station first. And I thought, well, you want some gum? What, 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 I have some gum. What, why, why, why do you want to go to the gas station? You know, I want to... Put in some more gas. And at that moment, you know, I drive to him, E. You know, I'm, I'm just like, oh, okay, we got about seven more miles here. We're good. No, we're good. Rosie, we're good, baby. We're going to be all right. No, dude. You know, and, and she goes, no. and what she said about this resonated so deeply about the spiritual life. And I said, what, what, you're three quarters of a tank full. Why are we going to the gas station? And this is what she said. She said, I'm going because I'd rather drive closer to full than to empty. I'd rather drive closer to full than to empty. He said, you never know when you're going to be close to empty and where there's another gas station around. And when she said that 11 years later, I go, what a revelation from God. Because most of us, we live close to empty. With Jesus, we we wait until we are already cussing people out. We wait until we're already irritable and angry. We wait until we are, we're just, just upset before we say, I think it's time to pray. Uh, yeah, I think it's time to pray. Oh, uh, yeah, I think I need about five minutes of prayer. I'm about to curse somebody out. I think it's time. That's living close to E. And, and there's a better way. 
There is a better way of living. And, and most of us, what happens is we begin our day. We get, when we're quiet with God. We read our Bible. We have our coffee. And we, go, we feel the presence of Jesus. And then what happens? We're filled. And then we go to work. We jump on the train. And we sit down in rush hour. And you know there's no space next to you. And someone decides they can fit in there. And they go, no, I can, I can move over. I can sit there. No, 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 there's no space here. Where are you going to sit? And they still sit in that space, leg all over and everything like that. It's just, and, and they're doing their elbow. Whatever Jesus Christ has deposited inside of you in your morning devotions, you are already at half a tank full now. You get to work and your boss says something critical about you. Your coworker steals your stapler. All of, all of a sudden, stuff is, this is not even lunchtime. You're a quarter of a tank full. Lunchtime comes, and there's a long line. They run out of your favorite food. They run out of pizza, whatever it is. All of a sudden, you are, by 5 o'clock, you're not even a Christian anymore. <laughs> and then with our rationale, with our faulty rationale, what do, we, what do we say to ourselves? This is what we say to ourselves. We say, we say let's do it again. Let me pray in the morning. How's that working for you? It's not working for me. And we do it again. There's a better way, a way of consistently, perpetually being with God so that we live closer to full than we do closer to empty. And this is where Paul is saying, devote yourselves to prayer. There is a, new, a better way of living in the world. And so I want to show you what I've, been, what I've been up to over the last two months in an effort to invite you to this kind of life. And I want to do right now, it's a scary thing to say. I want to do what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. And it's a scary thing for pastors to say. I'm going to say it anyway. Paul says, I want you to follow me as I follow Jesus. Amen. And so I want, you, I want to say, as your pastor, I want you to follow me as I follow Jesus. And I want you to experiment with this, okay? Because I believe if we do this, our church will be different. Your life will be different. A lot of our lives will be changed. And so this is what I've been up to and praying three and four times a day. And uh, I haven't, someone came to the first service and said, you mean you've been praying from 7 to 9.30 every morning? No, I have not been praying from 7 to 9. So let me just be clear. It is within these time frames where I, we're praying, I've been praying 10, 15 minutes at a time throughout the course of the day. And so in the morning, I have my morning prayer where I get up. And I pray the Lord's Prayer. I pray, Lord, your kingdom come. I want my kingdom to come, but I want your kingdom to come. I'm silent. I have some scripture, and, and I'm, I'm with God for 10, 15, 20 minutes or so. And then I recognize something about myself. I know by, by noon, I'm, my heart is already wandering. I'm already getting irritable. I'm already getting angry. I'm or, and, and I need to come back to Jesus. And so by noon, between noon and 2.30 or so, I'm coming back and saying, Lord, here I am. This is not new revelation. This is stuff the church has been doing for centuries. What I'm trying to do is reclaim it for us as a local church here. At 2 o'clock, I'm, I'm, I'm before God in prayer. And then I know something about myself. I know within that four-hour gap or so, my heart again has gone astray. And my mind has wandered away from the desire of, that Jesus has for me. And I need to come back to him again and be with him and pause again. You might ask, Rich, what if I'm at work? What if I'm in public? This is what I say to you. I say, I've seen people in other faiths committed to a, 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 a devotion of prayer that puts me, that puts Christians to shame. I was in Sesame Place one day. Sesame Place. With Big Bird and Elmo. And I was with Karis and we were walking around. And all It was doing Ramadan. And all of a sudden, a, a particular hour came, and this gentleman took out his carpet, took off his shoes, and started praying. And I'm thinking, I'm hiding my Bible on the train. Make sure, don't look at what I'm reading, you know. Don't look. And this guy all of a sudden is just praying. And I thought, that's the kind of devotion I want. But I'm not being fanatical here or crazy here, but Jesus wants all of me. Jesus wants to interrupt our schedules. Jesus wants us to order our lives around being with him. This is a radical shift. And let me tell you what it's done in me. Uh, I want to tell you, first of all, that this has not meant that I've been walking on water doing this. Actually, what it's done is ex it's exposed how weak and broken I am. As one, one of the days I was praying, and, and I went outside with Rosie and with Karis and with our son Nathan, and we're going in the car, and, and we're about to pull off. 
and I get the car seat in, and I notice that there's a car right alongside me, and this person says, uh, it wants to parallel park. Now, there was a lot of space to parallel, a lot of space to parallel, a lot of space to parallel park. And this person says to me, could you move up a little bit more? And so because I've been praying with God and before, because I've been sensitive to the power of the Holy Spirit, I say, no, you have plenty of space. And Rosie looks at me and says, weren't you just praying to Jesus, you know? And the person looks at me all of a sudden like, no, I'm not going to move the car up. You could put a bus in there. What's wrong with you? And, and, and all of a sudden I realize my prayer has really exposed my brokenness. And how weak I am. And I moved the car up a little bit. I mean, messed up. I hit the car next day. It was just terrible. But I noticed something about myself in this time. I noticed that about my own weakness. But what I also noticed is this. I noticed that doing this, keeping, praying these fixed hours has made me aware of the presence of God like never before. An awareness of who God is. Awareness of his presence. A couple, two weeks ago, Pete talked about practicing the sacrament of the present moment. And we talk about Brother Lawrence, the the, the famous uh, monk who practiced the presence of God. Let me tell you, it is impossible to practice the presence of God in the way that Brother Lawrence practiced the presence of God if we're not stopping throughout the course of the day. Because remember, Brother Lawrence was a monk stopping throughout the course of the day to be with God so that when he was active, he was reminded of who God is. And so I believe God is inviting us to pause, to stop. What has happened in me? My life has been comparing myself less and less to others. I've been uh, freed from some of the anger that was incessant. You don't realize how angry you are until you're silent in the presence of Jesus. And all of a sudden, stuff starts coming to the surface. I've been, uh, I, I think, loving my wife more. You can ask her to verify this at the end of the sermon here. But, you know, it's just, and, my, and our children more and being more present. And so much so that, you know, when I, when, I, when I pray, there's a sense sometimes where I go, I just, something inside, I just want to, I want to create and shape in the home. I want to clean up. I want to fix up the house a little bit. So Rosie loves when I pray. She's like, you know, the, the kitchen could use a little bit of fixing and the dishes could, could you pray a little bit so that God can move you again, you know? Something has happened inside of me. But how did I get here? How did I get to this place of, fixed hours of prayer where I've been encountering Jesus not just one time a day, but multiple times a day. It's because I've prayed a prayer, and I want to challenge you to pray a particular prayer. It's a very simple prayer, but I want you to pray it this week. But I want to let you know ahead of time, this is a dangerous prayer because this is a prayer that God will answer. And if he answers it, your life is going to change. And so it's dangerous, but I want you to pray it. Because it's going to change. And this is a prayer that I've been praying. And I prayed it for months, and all of a sudden, through a convergence of experiences, God met me. And this is what I've been praying. Lord, give me desire and discipline to seek you more and more. Give me desire and discipline to seek you more and more. I want desire because I don't want prayer to be an obligation. I don't want prayer to be something that I, I have to do. Oh, Pastor Rich said to pray at 9 o'clock. It's 9 o'clock. I guess I should be praying now. I'd be a good Christian. I want it to be desire. I want to want to pray. But at the same time, I know something about myself and I know something about you. You're not always going to have desire. And when your desire fades, what you need is discipline. And you need God to give you discipline so that you can stick with it even when you don't feel it. And let me tell you what happens in my life and what will happen in your life. You will, if you pray that prayer, God will answer the prayer. And then what starts to happen is this. You start wanting to pray. You start wanting to pray in such a way that you want to eat lunch. You don't go, oh, I guess I got to eat lunch again. You know, I guess I got to eat. No, no, you go, I want to eat lunch. My life depends on it. When you begin to pray that prayer, all of a sudden you start realizing, I want to pray. Because I realize my life depends on it. And this four words of Paul really become the reflection of what the gospel is. Because what the gospel is, is this. The gospel is the message that God is radically devoted to you. He dies on a cross. He resurrects. He forgives you. He pours out grace and mercy. 
God is devoted to you. And as a response to the devotion of God towards us, what he asks of us is that we would be devoted to him in prayer. And so I want to invite the worship team to come forward. And I, I want to challenge us in this room to do this together. That this week, that you would pray this prayer, Lord, give me desire and discipline. And not only would you pray that, that you would begin to order your life around times of prayer, whether it's two times or three times or four times, and watch what God does in your life. You can only get this as you experience it and live into it. This is not about hearing a sermon and going, yeah, yeah. It's, it's only when you practice it that you see the benefits of it. And so I want us to do this together as a church family. So let's pray together. I want to pray that God gives us desire and discipline. And these four words changed my life. And I believe these four words can change your life as well if we're open to it and change our church and change our city and change our country and change our world. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for an impartation of desire. Pray for an impartation of discipline. Lord, that we would seek you like we've never sought you before. Lord, we recognize how malnourished we are spiritually. Eating, as it were, a few times a week for some of us. And Lord, we recognize that to live really in the fullness of your kingdom, we need a spiritual nourishment that is daily. And so, Lord, I pray that you would fill us. Fill us, Lord with desire. Fill us with discipline. May we get a radical vision of what you have called us to be and, and what you've called us to do. And so, Lord, as we sing to you songs of worship and gratitude, I pray that you would fill us, move us, awaken us, touch us, Lord. We sing to you now. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. amen. Let's all stand together. Amen. I want to invite our our prayer team to come to my right. We have the Lord's table to my left. And we're reminded when we come to the table how devoted Jesus has been to us, broken and bruised, so that we might be whole and healed. And he's devoted to you. He's passionate about you. He, he continues perseveringly to love you. He doesn't stop. He's devoted to you. And so our response is to reciprocate that to him devoting ourselves to prayer and we have our prayer team to my to my right and you can come up for prayer for whatever you need maybe you're in a place right now of challenging times at work challenging times economically challenging times relationally just challenging life personally you're in a season of your life physically or whatever it is and so i want you to come forth for prayer to receive prayer but also want you to come forward if you really want desire and discipline you realize i want someone just to pray i need someone to pray for me because i want god to fill me with this for whatever need you have you can come forward but as we close here i want to invite you to open your hands towards heaven this is a position of receiving blessing and may god grant you desire this week as you ask him for it may god give you discipline as you ask him for it so that you can stick with what paul gives us here devote yourselves to prayer and watch what happens. Watch how he sets you free. Watch how he gives you joy. Watch how he floods you with peace. Watch how you get new perspective. Watch how you stop comparing yourself to others. Watch how you live with contentment. Watch what happens. And so with your hands and your hearts in the posture of receiving, brothers and sisters and sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he shine his face upon you. May he fill you with peace. And may you walk out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit with greater desire and greater discipline to seek him more and more. And out of that place of prayer, may God begin to set you free. May God begin to do in you what you cannot do in yourself. May you walk in grace. May you walk in peace. May you walk as a person who's been raised with Christ. And so I pray blessing. I pray power over you. The power of the Holy Spirit that fill you today. We pray this in the strength.